My plan this afternoon is to tell you about the changes uh, we made in undergraduate education during my, uh, the 24 years that I served as dean of the college at Princeton from 1987 to 2011, and to offer some observations about the strategies and tactics we used to get things done. Now imagine for a moment that we are back in 1987, uh, a time that at least some of you will remember firsthand. Uh, Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. Barack Obama was a community organizer in Chicago applying for admission to Harvard Law School. None of our current students was born. There was no internet, no email, texting, Skype, Facebook, cell phones, smartphones, iPads, Kindles. At Princeton, and I suspect that there are close analogs at Dartmouth, uh, it was a different world in terms of undergraduate uh, education. We had old-fashioned general education requirements, ours dated to the 1940s. We had a handful of freshman seminars, a handful of interdisciplinary certificate programs. Um, we had almost nothing going on in study and work abroad. We had no writing program, no center for teaching and learning, no four-year residential colleges, and we had a student body significantly different in size and composition from the one we know uh, today. Now all of that makes it sound as though it was a really different time and place, and in many ways it was. Um, but in essential ways uh, at Princeton, and I suspect um, also at Dartmouth, uh, it was the same place that we know today. For Princeton, the continuities are fundamental I typically describe Princeton as a world-class research university with the heart and soul of a liberal arts college. There are, I think, six basic underpinnings to that characterization. Continuities as descriptive of Princeton in 1987 as they are today. First, the deep engagement of our faculty in undergraduate education. Second, the close interaction between students and faculty members. The third, the conviction that an undergraduate program of study works best when it is well structured from general education requirements to the disciplinary major. Fourth, the universal commitment to independent work culminating in the senior thesis. Fifth, the confidence that living in a highly diverse, close-knit residential community contributes importantly to personal maturation and moral development. And sixth, the certainty that undergraduate learning happens outside as well as inside the classroom through spirited participation in activities that foster teamwork, test leadership, and develop habits of citizenship and service. With one exception, the Universal Senior Thesis, I suspect, I would wager that this list of fundamental continuities at Princeton applies equally to Dartmouth and its history over the last quarter century. Yet within that fundamental framework of rock solid continuity, so much has changed. There is a lot that's new in undergraduate education at Princeton as a result of the efforts uh, we made over the last 24 years. And what I'd like to do uh, is to sketch some of the most notable dimensions of the 
uh, changes. And then tell you a little bit about how we got uh, all of this uh, done. First, in terms of curriculum, um, there are a lot of new uh, uh, developments over these uh, decades. Uh, first, um, new general education requirements, uh, which we've organized in terms of approaches to knowledge instead of the previous uh, disciplinary baskets. And for us, we did this in the middle 1990s. This was the first uh, significant change in general education requirements at Princeton in a half century. We move very deliberately. <laughs> Second, as uh, Carol uh, suggested, a fund for uh, innovation in undergraduate education, which encourages and enables course development and curricular experimentation. We have the ability to say to the faculty, uh, we would like to support your best ideas. What would you like to do by way of new courses, renovation of existing courses? We have the wherewithal uh, to help you. Um, a third new initiative in undergraduate education, the Princeton uh, Writing Program, um, offering more than uh, 100 writing intensive seminars um, each year. Um, these seminars are a requirement for our uh, entering uh, freshmen. The Freshman Seminar uh, Program. Uh, that's a program that began with nine seminars in its first year, 1986-87, um, sorry. Um, and they were all in the humanities. They were funded by a Ford grant in the humanities. Um, the freshman seminar program now offers 75 to 80 uh, seminars uh, a year with course offerings drawn from the social sciences, natural sciences, and engineering as well as the uh, humanities. Our <clears throat> most experienced faculty members say it's the best teaching uh, they have the opportunity uh, to do. And I'm looking forward myself when I go back to the classroom next fall to teaching a freshman seminar on coeducation. Um, we now have um, interdisciplinary course sequences for beginning students in the humanities, in the natural sciences, and in uh, engineering. They have the reputation, uh, especially those in the humanities and in the natural sciences, for being a kind of uh, intellectual boot camp, and students take great pride in making their way through these very demanding, very exhilarating uh, sequences. Uh, we've had greatly increased opportunities for uh, our advanced students to supplement their disciplinary concentrations with interdisciplinary certificates. At Princeton, a certificate program is the functional equivalent of a minor at other institutions, but all of our certificates are interdisciplinary. Um, uh, the student who is majoring in politics and wants a certificate in uh, economics, we say, oh, sorry, um, we don't do that kind of badge collecting um, here. Um, we've seen almost a fourfold increase in uh, numbers of certificate programs over uh, the last quarter century, which I attribute to the increasingly interdisciplinary nature of knowledge and our faculty see opportunities for collaboration across disciplinary lines that significantly benefit our uh, students. Uh, Carol mentioned the Major Choices uh, Initiative. <coughs> this is um, a multi-pronged effort to encourage students to follow their intellectual passions to major in subjects they love, not the subjects their parents tell them they have to major in, not the subjects they think they need to major in in order to uh, get a good job or win admission to a particular uh, graduate or professional uh, program. Um, 
uh, where did this come from? Um, one day I was sitting in the president's office with the president and then provost, uh, and they said, what's the single initiative you could undertake that would most improve uh, undergraduate education? It's nothing like being put on the spot, um, <laughs> saying, let me get, have a week to think about it, uh, was not an appropriate <coughs> response. So I said, if we could redistribute concentrators so that students majored in the full range of departments at Princeton instead of uh, in a handful of large departments, we would measurably improve the quality of undergraduate education. Trouble with saying a thing like that is then you've got to go do something <laughs> um, about it. And we've done a lot from um, uh, publishing a little book called Major Choices, three editions thereof now, uh, profiling um, younger alumni who have gone on to really interesting lives and careers that in most cases had nothing to do with their undergraduate field of uh, concentration. And we distribute that book to entering freshmen. We send it to all of their parents. Um, it has a message in it that basically says, study what you love. Um, we talk to parents about it at freshman uh, parents' day. We, um, uh, have a programming in our residential colleges where faculty and upper class students and alumni from the smaller departments come and talk about what goes on in those fields or organize uh, special intellectual and cultural uh, events to engage students uh, in those uh, fields. So um, the message, study what you love, is clearly um, getting across to our uh, students. Well, we haven't by any means cracked the hegemony of economics and politics. If anybody knows how to do that, I'd love to know. Um, we have seen significant growth in uh, numbers of uh, majors in such areas as ecology and evolutionary biology, molecular biology, <coughs> psychology, uh, and on a more modest scale, significant growth in such fields as mathematics, classics, comparative literature, anthropology, sociology, and most recently, to my surprise and delight, geosciences. Um, so we're, we're pleased that students are taking better advantage of the full range of intellectual opportunities at Princeton and are allowing themselves really to revel in fields that just fascinate um, them. Another curricular initiative which uh, Carol uh, has spoken of and which I've talked about with uh, faculty committees um, since I've been here uh, is uh, the establishment by the Princeton faculty of a university grading policy uh, designed to address the persistent problem of grade inflation. Uh, the objectives of the policy, as I've uh, said to some of you uh, already, uh, are twofold. One has to do with uh, making more rigorous distinctions in grading so as to provide better information to students uh, about the difference between their most outstanding work uh, and their ordinarily good work. Um, the other uh, has to do with fairness uh, so that students in one department are being graded according to the same standards as students in any other uh, department. And we have brought the grades down. We've achieved a fair amount of fairness uh, and even-handedness across departments and divisions. The students don't love this. Um, uh, the Daily Princetonian, as I said to the Committee on Instruction earlier this afternoon, I was reading Friday's Daily Princetonian uh, last night in uh, the hotel. There's a little box on the front page about how I've been invited to speak at Dartmouth in this uh, Leading Voices series and how Dartmouth commented on some innovative things that we had done at Princeton during my deanship, but Dartmouth didn't say anything about the grading policy. <laughs> and they didn't know, but I had said some years ago that two schools had two Ivy institutions had invited me to come and talk about grading, and was Dartmouth one of them? Um, it never ends. Um, 
And the, the final uh, thing I'd like to point to in the area of uh, curriculum um, is that we've increased the number of courses required for the AB degree uh, from 30 to 31 uh, to accommodate the required writing seminar. Uh, AB students at Princeton take 31 courses plus two semesters of junior independent work plus a two semester senior thesis uh, that adds up to 35 uh, courses or course equivalents. BSE students at Princeton graduate with 36 courses, and their independent work is counted within uh, that course uh, total. A second big basket um, in which we've seen a lot of change over uh, these last uh, decades uh, is internationalization. Um, we have engaged in a deliberate effort to expand term time study abroad, uh, principally by working with individual academic uh, departments to identify or create programs of study at universities around the world that are particularly well suited to their uh, concentrators. It's been uh, important to us to work with the departments because as you know, students most often go abroad in the junior year. Well, for Princeton students, you have to be doing two terms of junior independent work in the junior uh, year. And so we've tried to um, create intellectual opportunities abroad where either um, there's a, uh, a seminar taught abroad for the concentrators in a, a department, um, like the English department has a program in dramatic literature, uh, which has taken place at the uh, University of London. So we send a Princeton faculty member to teach the English department's junior independent work seminar in the term that they're there, and they write their independent papers then growing out of that uh, seminar. Or the Woodrow Wilson School has a, um, what they call a, a policy task force taught uh, at Cape Town or at Hong Kong or at Oxford, um, either by a Woodrow Wilson School faculty member or by a faculty member from the home uh, institution, which counts as our students' uh, junior uh, independent work for that semester. And then they take the rest of their courses from among the offerings of the institution um, abroad. We've established an international internship uh, program which identifies and funds summer positions abroad that are linked to students' programs of uh, study. We've created an Office of International Programs uh, with um, increased staffing for study abroad, uh, international internships, and fellowship uh, advising. And we've developed a number of Princeton-sponsored, Princeton taught Princeton specific study abroad opportunities, mainly, although not exclusively, in the uh, summer. These include intensive summer language uh, programs uh, sponsored by, taught by our language department faculty in collaboration with institutions uh, abroad, faculty at institutions uh, abroad. Um, we offer so-called global uh, seminars taught by members of our faculty in many different fields, often uh, working in collaboration by f with faculty members at the uh, institutions abroad where our students go uh, for this uh, program. And we've uh, more recently established the uh, Bridge Year uh, program, uh, which enables a small number of admitted students to spend a Princeton-sponsored year in international public service before matriculating as freshmen. We have four sites abroad. We work with partner institutions that are accustomed to putting students in uh, homestays and in public service projects. We have intensive language uh, training. Uh, it's an extraordinary opportunity for the students who are uh, uh, brave enough and uh, imaginative enough, uh, enough to think about doing this 
for a year before matriculating uh, as uh, freshmen. Next category of initiatives that I'd uh, mention um, would be new vehicles for supporting and enhancing student learning. Uh, the McGraw Center for Teaching and Learning, which provides assistance to members of the faculty in perfecting their teaching, provides training for graduate students in becoming good teachers, and provides important support to undergraduates as they develop into more effective and expert uh, learners. Another unit, the Writing Center under the aegis of the Princeton Writing uh, Program, where anyone from the beginning freshman tackling the first paper in a college course to the dissertation writing graduate student can find tutorial assistance to improve their uh, writing. The community-based learning initiative, uh, which involves a partnership between university faculty and community organizations to infuse research that illuminates important community issues into courses and uh, independent work. We've started a number of <coughs> special programs and uh, awards. The first of these, um, uh, <coughs> the Freshman Scholars Institute, is a pre-freshman credit-bearing summer program for entering students for whom Princeton is a bigger step than uh, for most incoming students. The second, the Princeton University Preparatory Program, uh, which brings low-income high school students from surrounding communities to the university for three summers of intensive academic work and continues with term time academic support to prepare them to enter selective colleges and universities. The Princeton Creative Arts and Humanities uh, Symposium, which brings outstandingly accomplished high school seniors to the university for a weekend of intensive academic work in the humanities and creative arts um, under the aegis of our faculty. I said before that our faculty say that freshman seminars are the best teaching they do. When they come away from the precepts, say the intensive small group uh, interaction they have with our high school seniors who come uh, in the fall in this program, they say, wow, this is uh, the best uh, teaching you could possibly uh, do. Um, at the suggestion of um, Harold Shapiro, president of the university from 1988 until 2001, um, we've worked to recognize uh, academic excellence and outstanding performance by students, outstanding performance by faculty members in ways that we hadn't uh, before. The first thing Harold had us do was to create a um, President's Award for Distinguished Teaching, which we give to four faculty members, four of our faculty members each year at commencement. He wanted us to be featuring in a very public way uh, members of our faculty who are our very best uh, teachers. Um, he and his wife endowed uh, a prize, uh, an award for academic excellence on the part of freshmen and sophomores. He said, I want to uh, feature excellent academic work on the part of our youngest uh, students. So we give uh, this award on the basis of distinguished academic achievement in the freshman and sophomore year to about, it turns out to be roughly 3% of our freshmen uh, and sophomores. Uh, we do it to highlight our commitment to and our pride in uh, academic excellence. We give the award at a celebratory banquet with the residential college masters and deans, uh, the uh, President Shapiro, President Tillman, and um, a Princeton faculty member whose book we choose as the award 
uh, and um, who then comes to speak about the book. And you know, the last year it was uh, Nano Cohen talking about uh, her book on leadership. Um, the year before it was Cheng Ray Lee, and uh, no, we went back to Robert Fagel's John McPhee. You know, we we pick. Um, faculty members in books we think will be particularly um, appropriate for uh, these excellent uh, students. And the final um, awards I'd like to mention um, are um, summer awards and, po and postgraduate fellowships um, the endowed by um, an alumnus who came to me because he wanted Princeton to have merit scholarships. And it was my job to tell him that we would not accept money for merit uh, scholarships. And so we went back and forth for about a year about <coughs> his desire to um, reward uh, this sort of, uh, uh, to reward achievement irrespective of uh, need. And my insistence that we just weren't going to do that. And finally, he said, well, come up with a program that I'd like, essentially. <laughs> so we came up with this program, which um, um, enables students in the summer after sophomore year to pursue a potentially life-changing independent project of their own devising. Um, and then he liked that so much uh, that he said he would give us more money and we should do postgraduate fellowship that enabled graduating senior to pursue a year-long independent project of life-changing uh, potential. In terms of admissions, um, um, we've seen a more than two-fold increase in applications to Princeton during the years that I had responsibility uh, for the admission uh, office. Um, the class of 1991, which entered in my first year as dean, 1987-88, um, we had 12,620 applications. The class of 2014, which entered in my last year as dean, 2010-11, uh, we had 26,247 applications. That has nothing to do with me, I assure you. But my uh, splendid deans of admission, Fred Hargadon and Janet Rapoli, uh, have undertaken uh, um, uh, outreach of huge effectiveness. And I suppose uh, the undergraduate program has its attractions um, uh, as, uh, as well. Um, we have finally achieved a 50-50 gender balance in our applicant pool admitted class an enrolled class, and that took us a really long uh, time. The gender ratio in the enrolled class of 1991 was 60-40. We thought we were stuck at 60-40 for the longest time. When Fred Hargadon became dean, we got to about, oh, maybe 53-47. We thought we were stuck there, um, and uh, by coincidence, undoubtedly by coincidence, it was our um, elimination several years ago of early decision that coincided with the equalization by gender of men and women in our applicant pool and in our admitted and enrolled class. Why? We don't have any idea. But it, even now that we've gone back to an early program, um, we're still running 50-50, which is where we would feel most comfortable being. We have seen greatly increased racial and ethnic diversity in our undergraduate student body. Class of 1991, 21.6% uh, black, Hispanic, Native American, and Asian American. Class of 2014, 373 and for 15 and 16, um, the numbers are even higher. Um, we've seen greatly increased socioeconomic diversity, about which I'll say more in just a moment. Greatly increased representation of international uh, students. 51 international students entered with the class of 1991. 
141 entered in the class of 2014. And we have seen an expansion in the size of the undergraduate student uh, body. The entering class in fall 1987 was 1140. Uh, the entering class from fall 2008 forward, 1300. In terms of uh, financial aid, um, I'm, uh, I think one of my um, proudest and most moving days at Princeton was when our trustees agreed to spend the money required um, to establish our pioneering no loan financial aid uh, policy, which means that no entering student is required to take out a loan to finance his or her uh, Princeton uh, education. In other words, we substituted additional scholarship dollars um, for the loan portion of the financial aid uh, package. We also, um, and this is more sort of technical financial aid business, but it, I think it's important, we eliminated the consideration of home equity um, in calculating the family contribution we could expect from uh, families of students applying for uh, aid from uh, Princeton. So uh, our theory was that no family should be required to remortgage or sell the family home to send a child to Princeton. And when home equity was in the formula, that's what you really might have needed to do in order to meet the costs of coming uh, to college. We've been able to institute full need-based aid for international uh, students in place of the previous uh, limited financial aid budget for international students so that international students are treated in admissions just the way um, United States uh, and Canadian citizens uh, are. We've um, been able to increase our aid budget for juniors and seniors, and again, this is really Princeton detail, to enable eating club uh, membership. Lots of our juniors and seniors take their meals in eating clubs that are independent of the university. Uh, eating clubs charge a lot more for their meal contracts than uh, dining services uh, does. Um, what this change does is to set the board portion of the financial aid award according to the average cost of an eating club contract uh, rather than a university meal contract. So if students who are on financial aid want to eat <coughs> eating clubs, they can do so. Um, and finally, in the area of financial aid, I would point to the significant change in the socioeconomic composition of our entering classes. Um, we had 38% of our uh, class on aid in the entering class of 2001, the last class to matriculate before we began our new financial aid initiatives. Um, that's compared with about 60% routinely uh, now on aid in uh, entering classes. We had 88 low income students in the class of 2001, 208 in the class of 2014. Um, the last category of initiatives I want to uh, mention um, before telling you a little bit about how we did uh, these things um, has to do with the residential college uh, system at Princeton. Uh, we were able to establish a four-year uh, residential college system with freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and a small number of graduate students uh, in residence in some of the colleges. Um, colleges have faculty masters, facilities including dormitories, dining rooms, cafes, classrooms, libraries, game rooms, TV rooms, dance studios, small theaters. They have a host of social, cultural, and recreational activities. Um, there are some classes that are taught in college classrooms uh, and academic advising takes place in the colleges. All the advising for freshmen and sophomores and the non-departmental decanal academic advising for juniors uh, and seniors. 
we were able to build a brand new uh, collegiate Gothic four-year college, Whitman College, which opened in 2007, building collegiate Gothic in the 21st century. <laughs> you know, really something, but that's what our trustees insisted uh, that we do. Um, we were able uh, to raise and reconstruct some really unattractive 1970s cinder block uh, dormitories um, and um, to build a new set of modern uh, dormitories and academic and uh, social facilities for a second four-year college, uh, Butler uh, College. We've significantly expanded the staffing in our residential colleges. Um, so we have two decanal figures, one we call the dean, one we call the director of studies, just so you can tell them uh, apart. We've added directors of student life to essentially be the functional equivalent of the dean of students uh, in the uh, residential colleges. And these are the people who handle academic advising, provide personal counseling, handle crises, and uh, so on. As I said, we've transferred, or as I suggested, we've transferred non-departmental academic advising for juniors and seniors from the dean's office to the residential colleges. It used to be that there was one dean for the junior class, one dean for the senior class uh, in my office. Well now, um, as a junior or senior, you go back to see the dean or director of studies whom you knew as a freshman um, and a sophomore, whether or not you continue to live in your residential college. And that means that the conversation doesn't have to start all over again. You know, if you're um, deliberating between psychology and English in the spring of your sophomore year, and you pick one, and you come back in September and you're sure you made the wrong choice, you don't have to start from uh, the beginning. You can just go to the person you talked to in the spring and say, I made a mistake, and I want to switch uh, to the um, other one. So we think we do a better job of uh, supporting, dealing with, advising the whole student by having some continuity in the decanal figures with whom that student uh, will interact. And we've affiliated all of our juniors and seniors with their residential colleges, whether or not they are in residence. It's tricky at Princeton. No, in an ideal world, you'd have four-year colleges. Everybody would live there. Uh, everybody would eat there and whatever else they do for their social lives they do. Uh, given the history of the eating clubs at Princeton, uh, you can't do that without a political explosion the likes of which, uh, well, it would be like abolishing fraternities at Dartmouth, <laughs> something, something like that. Um, so the way it works now, uh, upper class students return to their colleges for some meals. We offer them two free meals uh, a week. Um, they come back, as I've said, for decanal advising um, and for a variety of activities and programs from intellectual and cultural events to wine tastings uh, to senior thesis writing boot camps. What might I say with respect to strategy, tactics, guiding principles? <coughs> as for principles, um, I've held fast to the fundamental continuities I described earlier. <coughs> what that means is you need to remember what kind of institution you are and build on that identity, not try to upend and transform it. I've appreciated the luxury, as I'm sure you at Dartmouth can, of thinking about change and improvement in undergraduate education when nothing is really broken. In other words, the luxury of starting with a first-rate educational program and thinking imaginatively about how to build on strength with, the, with some confidence that you'll have a good shot at resources to initiate programs and services that take undergraduate education to a new level of effectiveness. 
And I've tried to remember always where I came from. And what I mean by that is from the faculty. Um, by putting myself in the classroom and in advising roles whenever I could. And when I've done that, always making sure that my students are my first priority, no matter what meetings I may have needed to run or problems I may have needed uh, to solve. As for strategy and tactics, <coughs> I've adhered to these basic rules of the game. First, listen, listen, and listen some more. Listen to faculty, students, your administrative colleagues, also, perhaps inevitably, trustees. Your best ideas, I find, my best ideas come through listening. Copy shamelessly. Know what your peer institutions are doing and adapt, steal, borrow any good idea that's out there. Third, never leave anything to chance. The politics and the process are as important as the ideas. Uh, fourth, be prepared to compromise where necessary. Holding out to get everything you want and thereby jeopardizing or losing the whole game is pointless um, if a judicious compromise will get the support you need to achieve most of what you want. I'll give you a trivial, perhaps, uh, example. When we uh, proposed the new general education requirements at Princeton, which came out of a strategic planning committee and then two years of uh, iterative discussion between the Committee on the Course of Study and the faculty. The uh, Strategic Planning Committee wanted to uh, call one of the distribution areas aesthetic analysis and creative expression. And um, an English professor told me uh, that he would fight me to the death <laughs> over aesthetic analysis. That got my attention. Um, <laughs> so my principal associate dean and I invited him and another faculty member, the chair of art and archaeology, uh, to lunch to talk about this. And um, we said, so let's talk about what the distribution area is trying to achieve. Complete agreement about that. So we said, uh, what would you like to call it? And that's how the distribution area came to be called literature and the arts. <laughs> um, I've lost count, but other basic rules of the game. Never go to the faculty for a vote that you think you are going to lose. <laughs> Next, prepare, prepare, and prepare some more. If you go to the faculty, for action on an important proposal, you should have consulted so intensively and extensively beforehand that you know everything about and have done your best to accommodate any objections that might be raised. And plan what will happen on the floor of the faculty. Uh, I learned this from Bill Bowen. Um, uh, you don't just go to a faculty meeting and present an idea and see what happens. <laughs> you need to make sure people turn out, you know, get the members of your committee that are proposing this initiative to each to bring a certain number of faculty colleagues who will support, the, the ones who will support the plan are <laughs> more desirable. Um, plan who's going to speak on the floor of the faculty, make sure the president who's presiding has a little list of the faculty members you've lined up to speak. Um, as I say, Bill Bowen is a master at all of this, and um, uh, I find that it works. Um, next, be patient. Don't give up. Be prepared to wait. It can take years, even decades, to accomplish an important objective. Times change, circumstances change, 
and an initiative that at first looked impossible to achieve can be made urgent because of other developments that could not have been foreseen. The first report I wrote for a faculty committee proposing a four-year residential college system was in 1990. Our four-year residential college system uh, made its debut in 2007. Um, for a variety of reasons, that first proposal had to be um, put in a drawer. Um, and then when we decided to expand the size of the undergraduate student body and we needed a new residential college, there was an opportunity to talk about how the whole system would be constructed without it appearing that we were threatening the eating clubs by taking juniors and seniors away from them because there were more juniors and seniors to go um, around. No, this idea got started with Woodrow Wilson back um, in the first decade of the 20th century. So in, in one way, it took us a century. I was only working on it for 17 or 18 uh, years. Um, and um, finally, under strategy and tactics, I would say, uh, know when to fold your tent and cut your uh, losses. For Princeton, the quintessential example is changing the calendar. Shirley Tillman and I would have given our eye teeth to change the Princeton calendar. Um, we send students off for vacation so many times, it's truly embarrassing. Um, it would be good to have exams before Christmas. At Princeton, the faculty votes the calendar, and you need a majority of whichever faculty members happen to show up for a faculty meeting, and believe me, there is nothing that will draw um, <laughs> faculty to a faculty meeting um, but a proposed uh, change in the uh, calendar. My favorite story about calendar change, uh, it just, um, when, when Princeton instituted a fall break uh, back in the wake of Cambodia and Kent State to enable students to um, campaign for political candidates, work within the system. Um, there was a debate about this on the floor of the faculty. This was well, well before I was an administrator. And um, the proposal was to take a week off in the middle of the semester. And um, a biologist stood up and said, um, you people in the humanities just don't understand. We work with live animals. And we rely on students to be here to feed the animals. <laughs> we couldn't take a week off in the middle of the semester. And an English professor stood up and said, um, well, that's very interesting. I never thought about that. What do you do in the spring term when we've always had a spring vacation? And the biologist said with a very straight face, I don't teach in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> the level of discussion about calendar change over the years that we spent trying to figure out a way into it was about at that um, level. Let me um, conclude with a few words about the agenda for undergraduate education going forward. Remember, I'm an historian. I'm trained to reflect on the past, not to forecast the future. Still, I have some instincts about what one might expect. Uh, first, international, international, international. Uh, at Princeton, we aspire to get to a point where we can tell every entering student that international experience will be part of their Princeton education, where the question becomes what kind of international experience or what kinds the student will have, not whether the student will go abroad. I don't presume to know where Dartmouth stands in this respect and what might be appropriate here, but increasing internationalization strikes me as a safe bet for the future. Um, increased opportunities for entering students to have the benefit of small group seminars led by members of the professorial faculty. In other words, enhanced interaction between students and faculty, ideally in small group um, settings. Um, further development of the educational potential of the residential setting. If we're going to be able to 
explain why you would spend $50,000 or whatever it is to come to a school like this, the two points I just made are critical. Um, the interaction of faculty members and students and what comes educationally from being in a residential setting with other extremely accomplished students are critical pieces of our um, argument. Surely we will be focusing on the wise use of technology. There will inevitably continue to be changes in the ways that students access information, uh, communicate with their teachers, and extend intellectual conversation beyond the classroom. And the savvy institution will harness and direct those changes to its educational benefit. Uh, what that will mean, I can't possibly forecast, but it's very clear to me that technology cannot substitute for direct in-person interaction between students and teachers. And I think we need to look toward the future through the lens of humility. Remember that we just don't know what to expect. Uh, in 1987, I could not have forecast more than a small fraction of the initiatives I told you uh, we've undertaken uh, at Princeton. And I certainly can't forecast, um, and I don't think any of us can, what's going to happen over the next quarter century to enhance undergraduate uh, education. And finally, as you look to the future, I would say um, one needs, you need to ground the changes you undertake um, in undergraduate education in the fundamental characteristics, in the long-running continuities of your institution. In short, I'm arguing uh, you should be working to sustain a delicate balance. On the one hand, preserving and strengthening enduring traditions and historic commitments, but on the other hand, taking on ambitious new challenges to keep undergraduate education fresh, alive, and responsive always to needs and opportunities that we may be able to foresee or that may be just over the horizon. Thank you very much.